This is Red Pub Pod. Red Pub Pod. Red Pub Pod. Red Pub Pod. Wait a minute. A podcast. Red Pub Pod. From Red Hot Publications. Red Pub Pod. Red Pub Pod. Red Pub Pod. Welcome to Red Pub Pod. I'm Richard Eller, director for Red Hawk Publications. Joining me today is our publisher, Robert Knight. Welcome to Red Pub Pod. And our project manager, Patty Thompson. Greetings. Today we have with us a most esteemed guest. He is the president of Catawba Valley Community College, only the third one we've had. We were talking about how that's a, a bit of a rare thing in the community college system these days. Dr. Garrett Henshaw, welcome. Guys, thank you all so much for having me with you today. What's it like running a community college? Uh, it's, it's exciting. I mean, you see the difference that we make in this community's life. It's overall life from the arts to the economy to the workforce development pieces of it, to seeing people reach their dreams through us. Uh, there's not a better job in the world that I can think of. <laughs> Even in the tough times? Even in the tough times, it's still better than the alternatives. Okay. Well, one of the reasons we wanted to uh, sit down with you is the new book that we have coming out that details all the history of CVCC called Nimble and Tenacious, which is actually one a, a title you liked. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's representative of what this college was from the very beginning from Mr. Papp and as it evolved with Dr. Dunbar. And, and then what I've been able to view here is, is just amazing to me of, of how committed the people that work here are to, the, to our mission. This is part two of a uh, two part about this book. Yesterday, we, we had the wonderful opportunity to have Melanie Zimmerman in who worked with us on the design and layout of the book. And we talked about the word nimble, and she told us an anecdote, a story about her own studies here and how her instructors were able to assist her in designing her classes, executing her classes in such a way to make her successful. And uh, she maintained the tenacity Mm -hmm. in getting them done, and her instructors in the institution maintained the nimbleness to let her get those things done the way she needed to do it. And I think that's a thing that CVCC carries proudly is the fact that we make education available to people who want it and create the opportunity when their schedules might not work out. Yeah, I mean, think about the whole history of of this whole region. It's been about taking innovation and and making things and doing things, and I think that's the mindset that we've taken on at this college, that every student is a project. Every student has the opportunity to reach their goals, make a difference in this community. We want them to stay in this community, but even if they don't, they're making a positive impact somewhere. And I think when we look at those opportunities on a daily basis, we don't forget about how important every interaction is with our students. We, we need to understand that every day we have an opportunity to change somebody's life because even in my own personal educational experience, there was one teacher that made the light bulb go on. And it wasn't even class related. It was about that teacher taking an interest in me and telling me I had value. It's not lost on me that part one was actually not only a student at Catawba Valley Community College, but a really proud alumni. Absolutely. This was a love letter to her Mm -hmm. doing this project, and it's a perfect bookend that the person who laid it out and and did so much work on it was part one, and you are the leader, the visionary, the third president. Well, it's it's one of those things where we... um, I get opportunities to meet people that are alumni every day, whether I'm at Walmart or wherever I'm at, and I hear about the impact that this college made in their life and where they're at in a trajectory and what it did for their families. Um, We're right at the hub of everything that happens in this community, and understanding that audacious responsibility of of that and how we impact everything else that happens here, uh, it's exciting, and, and it's just it's one of those things that I'm passionate about and will remain passionate about for several years. You want to talk about some of those audacious moves that has happened since you got here? I mean, you weren't here hardly any time at all, and then you said, the Sim Hospital, that's what we need to do on the fifth floor. Yeah, you know, I, I, I used to watch this college from across the river when I was at another community college as executive vice president. I was just like... Wow, if that college reaches its full potential, this whole region's going to be better. And then taking that on as as I walked in as the third president and seeing all the wonderful things that Mr. Papp and Dr. Dunbar had done was an inspiration to me to say, hey, it's my responsibility to take it to the next level. Let's be innovative in the inspiring spaces that we create here. 
uh, I, li- I got a lot of, res- I guess, resistance in the beginning. <laughs> People telling me, good luck with this and good luck with that, but then we would accomplish it. And I think then it set the mindset of we can do anything we put our minds to and anything that we do to bring partners together to assure that every aspect of this community is is made better. And we've we've gone in a lot of different directions with that, right? Yeah, and we tried some stuff that didn't work so good, too. Yeah. But, but that's that's a part of having an entrepreneurial mindset and, and really being committed to innovation. You, you have to understand there are risks to every innovative thing that you want to do, and uh, you have to accept those risks and own those mistakes if, if they don't work out. But by and large, the, the great things that have happened here have been because people bought into that vision of us being the best in this business. And there is tenacity in trying something. Uh, some people will not try something, and therefore you don't know if it'll work or not. Yeah. But here at CBCC, it seems like you and those who came before wanted to at least attempt something. I mean, uh, Richard, the, what was the man's name who who we call the godfather of the game? Tom Dana. Tom Dana. His tenaciousness of not stopping until he had this, this uh, uh, education center that he wanted that is where we get the whole foundation of the way this college works. Absolutely. And and when people begin to trust you as an organization and they begin to lean in behind you and look for you for leadership, uh, that puts you in, in a situation where you need to be right most of the time. And I think what the, the individuals who work here and the students who come here understand, we're going to make every effort to get it right. But if we mess up, we're going to own that and we're going to be held accountable for it. And, and that's sort of the mindset that we've used from day one over the last 16 years. Well, there was an example of a program in the book that, um, you know, some local grocery stores needed their clerks and their employees to be trained in a specific new kind of cash register. Maybe it was the scanners. I'm not sure exactly what it was, but what did CVCC do? But set up classes that set up these faux uh, checkout lanes, train the people. And when the people were trained the program went away, and we took that and put it into something else. I mean, there is no other type of education that I'm aware of that can do that kind of quick thing. Yeah, especially in higher education. I think we're seeing the the mindsets change in higher educational leadership across the country uh, because higher education, I I refer to it as as an aircraft carrier. It's very hard to turn an aircraft carrier. I think we've become the U-boat. We identify those opportunities, and if something's not working, then we call time out, stop it, and rebuild it. We re- rebuild it based upon what the needs of, of our community. And the, f- the furniture program is a prime example of that. Uh, you know, it was the mainstay program for this institution for 40-some years. And we saw that it had lost its relevance, not because it was anybody's fault. We just couldn't keep up with the change in technology, and so they weren't hiring our graduates. We called time out, created the Furniture Academy, which was very much business-driven in terms of the competencies that they wanted to see coming out of there. And 100% of the students have been hired since we did that in 2014, I believe, is when we launched. And that's a program that's, that shows you sustainability. Now, in five or ten years from now, we may need to change again. We've got to be willing to do that and not just hold on to what we've always done that's been successful in the past. And I guess this program, Red Hawk Publications, is another example of that. I mean, you're, you're taking a step out that no other community colleges are doing, right? Yeah, I, I do crazy stuff, and that's <laughs> what all my president peers say about me. They're like, why are, why are you trying this? I just see opportunities for us to bring value that no one ever imagined because every person that walks onto this campus, they, they usually say to me, I had no idea what was here because of the stigma of what a community college had been historically, where you went if you didn't go any, couldn't go anywhere else. That's not what we're about. We're about being the first choice now. And the more people that we tell that story to, and the more people that begin to see the value of what we do, our future is going to be amazing. And then we mentioned this yesterday, so if you haven't listened to part one, you need to listen to part one. I attended a workforce development conference, and it made a real big impact on I mean, one of the speakers asked the entire room of 300 people, what was the number one graduate school in North Carolina? And the answer was the community college. Yep. So it may not be the first choice, but I'll tell you what, for a lot of folks who get their, and I'm an English major, uh, we end up at the community colleges oh, for no the question. practical skills. So, again, that nimbleness, it helps people find 
fine tune what they need to no, do for their no careers. No doubt about it, but Patty. It's it's one of those things that if if we're not embracing that, we run the risk of becoming obsolete in this environment. There's too many private market institutions that uh, know how to market. They know how to do the things to 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 really create impact. We've got to be right there beside of them and creating those same impacts at a higher level than everybody else. And hopefully what we do will help all the other colleges continue to drive forward too and try new things and like we have with Red Hawk Publications. And uh, it's it's been a journey. It's not been something that's easy. Um, a lot of people didn't understand it and still don't understand it. <laughs> but I understand it because of the value it can bring to people through education. And that value just keeps building on our building blocks to, to put us at a different level. And as I mentioned in part one, those of you out there who live in North Carolina, please get in touch with your elected officials and ask them to raise the uh, <laughs> budgets for your local community colleges because there is a lot of good to be done with your local community colleges, all 58 of them in the state. And the community college does not get the kind of funding that the giant four years get, and we would like to uh, raise that a little bit because we can well, do wonderful things with it. it. You look at the return on investment that community colleges create here in North Carolina, the over 700,000 people that come through our doors each year. That's the backbone of North Carolina's workforce. And when you look at the traditional funding model that was established 60 years ago when community colleges first came on the scene, we're still at the same levels that we were 60 years ago. But Tell, tell me that the return on investment for that 700,000 student population isn't worth more than seven cents out of every dollar that's spent on education in North Carolina. Yeah, we've done more with less for a long time. Yeah, and we've been our own worst enemy, too, because we have. If we would have How stopped, well, if we would have stopped doing things like nursing and said we just can't afford to do it, then that would have had an impact on the community. But no, we figured out how to do it, and we do it in a broad scale approach that is effective for every sector in, our, in each and every community. And our biggest value is our boots are on the ground here every day. We're serving primarily two counties, Catawba and Alexander. So we have to know what is going on in Catawba and Alexander counties, and that's where our focus has to be. And to be at the forefront and in the hub of everything that happens with economic development, workforce development, college transfer, that is the, where you get the answers to why community colleges do what we do. We figure it out. And that's the sort of the modality that we've used over our history. So you're saying sometimes when you're doing more with less, it's a detriment. Yeah. It's, it's kind of like one of our colleagues, Richard, that tells us, stop working so hard and making the rest of us look bad. <laughs> well, it, it, it's a, it's a, we get that. It's a, it's a detriment <laughs> because then the, everyone expects you to continue to do that. And we, we operate on such slim margins in the community college system that, you know, we're having to make some hard decisions, especially in rural North Carolina right now, trying to figure out, okay, how do we prop up our small businesses? How do we assure that we can provide a talent pool to these new businesses that want to come into this area? And that's a constant challenge for us, and it really stretches us to where we run a lot of risk when we, we say yes to these things. One thing I noticed in the, the working through the text is that we started out as a workforce development, an industrial helper to business in, in the community. And then we got into um, curriculum, college transfer courses. But now our newest building is right back to that first objective. So we've kind of come full circle in it, that one. Yeah, you know, workforce development is the core of what we do. Um, you know, the, the opportunity for open access to community colleges, we don't turn away anybody. We take everybody where they're at and take them to where they want to be, as Dallas Herring would say. And to, to be able to do that but have a keen focus on the core mission of what we were established to do is an important transition that I think all colleges are going through right now. They're looking at these new centers. They're looking at building these innovative spaces for new business startups and incubation and that sort of thing. And it, it really is where we bring the most value to, to the state of North Carolina. And sometimes that's partnerships because we've not only got uh, with work with Manufacturing Solutions Center, then we've partnered with Gaston College mm -hmm. to uh, do the te textile technology mm -hmm. uh, center. Yeah, yeah, it's it's all about partnerships, and I tell every, everyone that I speak to that that's our secret sauce here is we know how to partner. We don't have to compete. Uh, yeah, com competitions 
kept in place, but we're going to work together wherever wherever it's going to benefit this whole region, especially here in Catawba County and Alexander County. If you look at the latest census data, we were the only county in our, our region that actually grew in population. So whatever we do here at this institution is going to have, if it's a positive thing, it's going to have a positive impact on all those other community colleges around us because it's going to give them other opportunities, and we're open for partnership with any program of study that we start. We're open for partnership for anything that they're doing to where we can move more people through our system. You really love hammering out those partnerships and forging those new relationships, don't you? Yeah, I do, because I, I get to, like we used to say in Yadkin County, hey, y'all, watch this. And we, <laughs> and we, Sometimes that's famous last words, but okay. But, but we set the example. Yeah, you know, it's it's the history of the community college system in here in North Carolina. The 58 colleges fought each other tooth and nail on um, marketing and everything else. And I'm like, I don't really care where people go, but if they choose the community college system, we all win. I will say one thing. It's, it's funny you should say, hey, y'all watch this. That seems to have been the impetus of this campus. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was from Thomas, Dana, and and Pap, and, and Dunbar. And you're the third to take the torch. Every single one of you, from it, the moment this campus was conceived, it was a, hey, y'all watch this attitude. And having to partner. Yeah. So I commend you for keeping that torch lit. Well, I, I loved my first the first of several meetings I had with Mr. Pat because he told you exactly how it was. And he, he said, you know, I had to buy the pencils and I had to buy the paper. I, I had to do all that stuff. He says, you don't have to worry about that now. So just take this thing to the next level. Build upon what we've done and make this college something that this whole region will be uh, impressed with. Yeah, and I think we, we've done that. I mean, in your 16 years, there's this campus doesn't, I said this on the last podcast, uh, if you were a student here in the 80s and 90s, you need to come back and see what's different because there's a lot. Yeah, I want that. I had no idea uh, because it, it, is, it is changing and it's growing with the community around us and responding to the needs of the community and creating inspiring spaces for learning, to me, is one of the most critical things that we do. If a student walks into four walls, tables, and chairs and gets a lecture, there's not a lot of inspiration around that unless the lecture is like Robert Knopp and just inspirational <laughs> when, he, when he goes at it. But if we build spaces where a person feels good the moment that they walk into our facilities, they've got a chance to learn at a much higher level. And that's that connectivity that we look for for every individual that comes onto our campus. Well, that's some of what I think we're able to do here that makes Red Hawk Publications interesting in that we've partnered, we followed your lead on this, and partnered with our photography program, our graphic arts program, our print shop, uh, anybody that wants to do something that is helpful on campus, or we can use their resources to help train their students. It, it always works out pretty well. And really, it's in, it's partnering with people who want to say, hey, y'all watch this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It, it's about the relevancy of, of what we do. I think sometimes we get, uh, in higher education, we get uh, sort of bogged down into theory. But it's how do we make that relevant for every student so they understand while they're have, having to uh, learn how to process information, how to, how to move through formulas, how to, you know, think about history in a different way, and then putting their hands on it. And, you know, Richard was doing hands-on history. Uh, for a long time before I got here, I guess. And, uh, just a couple years. Okay, no, a couple of years. And I saw that, and I, and I started listening to the students who experienced it, and I was like, that's it. That's what we have to do in every program area if we're going to maintain the relevance so that when people see our graduates, they, they're they going to know that they have those real-life experiences. I, I will say today, just meeting with one of our recent graduates, Jamie. Yeah, uh, Jamie Buck. Um, Bruckheimer? Bruckman. 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 Yeah. She recently graduated from our graphic design department, and she came to us a year ago as a student, but she was one of the top in her class. And the many things that she has done for us blows us away. Yeah, Jamie just won the President's Award, the top award given at the institution. And I read her, her uh, application, and I was like, well, this is a no-brainer. This is exactly who represents who we want every student to be. And I was so proud of her with, with what she's been able to do here. Today was the first time I got to see her since she graduated. So, and we, you know, we're at the staff of full-time three people with Red Hawk. We have 
a few part-timers. She's one of our treasured part-timers. Yeah. And the fact that she's now graduating it, with much trepidation, I asked her, so what are your plans? And she's got an interview with Vonzel. I hope things work out for her. Mm-hmm. Um, but that all said, you know, we asked her. It's like, well, who else is in the pipeline for us? Who's our next Jamie? And, she, you know, she's got some ideas. So it, it's a bittersweet moment when you see your little bird fly, you yeah. know. But I'm happy for her. But isn't it the amazing, the personal transformation that occurs with those individuals? I can think of so many stories where I'd run into somebody in the parking lot and, and they would be just sitting in their car crying. And one in particular said, I don't belong here. She said, I, I've pulled into this parking lot 20 times and drove back out because I don't belong here. And I said, come with me. And I grabbed her by the hand and just said, come on, let's go. I'm going to show you exactly why you do belong here. And now that person works for us. And that was someone who was a first-generation college student, didn't understand what higher education, was intimidated by it. And now she's passionate about it. And that, that's the stuff that just makes me get up in the morning. Yeah, we don't think about this campus as being intimidated, but a lot of people oh, yeah. see it that way. I mean, we just drive onto it every day, but it can be. But I think once they get, if they can just get over that first hump, that first class, that first test even, and be successful there, then you start feeling a whole lot better. You know, you know, it's 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 not rocket science. It's just a class. Well, you know, the thing about it is um, our society, our culture uh, loves to put labels on people. So yeah. a, lot of, a lot of these individuals have been told they're not smart enough or they, they're not good enough. We give them the opportunity to see how the good they can be. And if we approach it from, from that standpoint, the results are, are just incredible for the success stories that we have, as Melanie Zimmerman represents and now Jamie and all the other thousands and thousands of graduates that have experienced our environment here. That's one of the things that led me to employment here back in uh, 2007 uh, was the fact that I had had an opportunity to work at Lenore Ryan. And I just asked myself, uh, do these people, do these kids at Lenore Ryan need you as much as the kids at CVCC do? And it just dawned on me that the kids at CVCC could use me better than what the kids at Lenore Ryan could. And over the years, when you tell a person that they're smart and they burst into tears and say, nobody has ever told me that I'm smart, and they're 30 years old, you really don't understand what things are withheld to, from some folks. Absolutely. That you give them as an educator, and this is sometimes that place where people will come to get that last place that is going to help them find a dream. Yep. And when somebody, when an instructor helps them or moves on something or tells them, you know, you got this, you can do this, and they realize they can, that's power in that. Well, when you think about the types of individuals that come into these walls or through our online platforms, these are individuals that most likely have had issues in the past. And I remember um, one student who, who came here and said, I've got a criminal record. There's no hope for me in the future. And I said, no, come on. Let's, let's see what we can do. And he ended up being the president of Phi Theta Kappa, went on to UNC Chapel Hill on a full ride, and now is a lawyer. That's somebody that, that mattered, and it's somebody that we took under our wing and said, let's go, let's reach your full potential. And that's the way we approach every student. And we got one like that. I mean, think about Josh Proby, yeah. who uh, I met through the Office of Multicultural Affairs, who also had a criminal record, but wrote while he was in prison and wanted to know if there was an outlet for that writing. We said, absolutely there is. Yeah. We published. He's gone on to a, a larger publishing company and also an entrepreneur, right? Yeah, yeah. He's, he owns his own trucking company now, and he's also got several other programs. The guy's just got a magnetic personality, and he just loves to get up on the stage and, and give you advice, because if there's been a mistake to make, Josh has made it, and, and he'll tell you how to avoid it. And the thing about it is, those stories are endless, and they're all around us. And so the way I approach leadership here is, is why shouldn't we do this for our students? If it's going to give somebody an opportunity to be one of our stories, why shouldn't we do these things? It may be harder, but they're worth every ounce of effort that we put forth. And I think if there's a base thing that Red Hawk Publications 
can hang its hat on is capturing those stories. Because more, the more people that know what these folks have gone through to be here and to be successful, the more they not only appreciate them, but appreciate those who helped them. And that's the community college. No question about it. Uh, you know, we're about inspiring the future. And when you look at the people that uh, come to us every day, we're doing that. We're doing it on a daily basis. Yeah, we have bad days sometimes where we don't do as well. But for the most part, I expect everyone to come in with that opportunity that today might be the day that I change somebody's life. And if we do that, wow, what an impact we're going to have long term. Oh, absolutely, yeah. I think Melanie was instructive in that she said her parents expected her to go to college and her brother to make things and build things. And actually, it was the opposite, that she wanted to make things and build things and found out that she could through CVCC because she not only works and as the alumni affairs officer, she also what teaches stained glass? She teaches stained glass down yeah. on the East Campus every Monday night. Which yeah. means, I guess, anything can be taught if somebody's willing to teach it. Yeah, yeah, anything's possible, and that's that's our approach to how we do stuff. And um, I don't want I don't ever want us to limit ourselves to the way we've always done it. And I've got a, a picture up at the office that everybody sees as they come into my office. Eric, that's my, the most six, the six most expensive words in business, but it's also the six most detrimental words in education. As we've always done it that way. Mm -hmm. Because there's always new ways to to do things, as uncomfortable as it makes people. Yeah, and, and I mean, you know, change is hard and, and processes are tough, and sometimes we have misperceptions that we can't do this because it's law when really we've built this on policy ourselves, and the policies can be changed easily if there's a good rationale for it. And they should be changed periodically because things change around us. It's change around us so fast in days technological environment, social environment. Uh, we, have to, we have to be nimble and tenacious. And that's the thing about this book, I think, is that it, you know, if you think about it as an institutional history, oh, man, I could use that for a sleep aid. But <laughs> because we have been as nimble and as quick to turn on a dime at times, mm -hmm. That makes this a whole lot more uh, adventurous story than you would think. Probably not every community college has that story to tell. Well, it, it is an adventure, and we, <laughs> we haven't even reached uh, where we're seeing the end of that journey because it never ends. And what our goal has to be is that whoever comes in here after us, that we have set a table for them that shows them a pathway to success beyond our wildest dreams. And, and that's been my ultimate goal since day one. What's in the future? Oh, a lot of good stuff. New programs, uh, new ideas, new opportunities. Uh, I think you're going to see this college uh, continue to grow. Um, we've got to look at different opportunities for what our students' needs are in terms of housing and things like that. Who knows where we're going to end up, um, but it'll be in a better place than we started. That's, that's true. Richard, you were pretty much the principal author. I have a question for you. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I get to read most of the documents towards the end as a final proof, so I can I don't have to read it five times. As I read it, to me, it's interesting. So what did you learn the most out of reading this that you did not know? I think that thing that I referred to earlier is it's just much more of a dynamic story than you would think it would be because you've got three guys who have helmed this school, and each one of you had a different personality, brought a different skill set, as Robert was talking about, and um, made a real difference because, you know, you think about right when Dunbar came in, um, who would have thought that the old Nichols department store could be as valuable as it has become to this institution? Absolutely. And you know, I think that's the most important role of a board of trustees, and I think this board, over its history, has been very effective in that, because who who would have thought that I could come in after a president that was here for 18 years or so um, as a 39-year-old rookie? Who, who thought that this board would ever give me an opportunity? You were the youngest at the time, right? Yeah, the, youngest uh, in the whole state. Yeah, yeah, and, and who, who would have thought that an institution of this size would give me my first shot? And I think that's the mindset of the trustees, too, is, hey, y'all, watch this, and let's see what happens. And, uh, you know, it's just they'll do the same thing after I leave. They'll think about where this college is and where it needs to go, and they'll find the right person because 
I think we're an attractive commodity out there in our in our network. And I think whoever comes in here will be of high caliber that can take it even further to the next level. Do you guys believe that 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 that, that philosophy comes from the institution itself and the people who, you know, are on the board of trustees and come to work here are infected by it? Because it seems to continue this idea of, you know, we're going to do this. Hey, y'all watch this, mm-hmm. uh, you know, because everybody seems to be on the kind of the same channel when it comes to that thing. So since the institution kind of started that way, maybe it's the place that does that to the people who come here instead of vice versa. Well, I think it works both ways, Robert, because I also believe that the the reason this institution is that way is because that's the way our whole community was built before we even existed. Uh, It was about how you do stuff. How, how, How do we make things better? How do we work together better? And when you look at the fabric of this community, those individuals are now on our board of trustees. They've experienced ah. all that. And so they understand those dynamics, uh, whether they were in furniture and banking or whatever. They saw this community transform and go through tough times, but also see us really excel. I see that purely by reading the complete history of Hickory, also available on redhawkpublications.com. Shameless plug. Um, written by <laughs> Richard Eller. But the fact is... And it's, not dry and boring either, because <laughs> Professor Eller doesn't do dry and boring. But that whole, how Hickory was tenacious itself, and partnerships, relationships, making sure that everyone was taken care of, whether it was through a pandemic or through a fire, it it's baked right in. Yeah. So you're absolutely right. We have followed the, the city of Hickory's growth. Yeah, and I, and I think it's it's a part of the fabric that will be maintained here because when I work with the county commissioners and leaders in this region, they all have that, that mindset ingrained with them because their families experience this, this type of thing. I think it lives on and it'll, it's going to provide all the fruits that we've ever imagined for this whole region. Well, I think you get it with each president going out. They look at the next one and go, top that. Because <laughs> you, you set a standard. Yeah. And once you've set that standard and you're, you're good at it uh, and you've gotten a name for it, then it's up to you, to the next one, to build on it, which I could... I would hear you. I could just hear you saying that to whoever comes in, you know, following you. Uh, you know, if you think you can do better, let's see it. Yeah, I think anybody who chooses this line of work to be a community college president has a has a competitive nature to them, and they understand that you know sometimes we are on an uneven playing field when it comes to higher education. So, how do we take the little ship that could and make it great? And I think you see that a lot in sports. I'm a sports guy, so I'll give a sports analogy. You see uh, Appalachian State University beat a Michigan. Yeah. Um, that's the way I see us, you know, and it's like when we walk into uh, whether it's Skills USA or it's bass fishing, we're coming to play. But that means that everybody has to be preparing, getting ready, and, and really conditioning ourselves so that we can compete in those markets. And I think that's what a next president will bring into it is, Okay, I see what, what Henshaw did here. I think we ought to take it to here, here, and here. And I'm sitting there applauding them, standing behind them, saying anything that I can do to help you, I'll be there. If not, I'm going to stay out of your way. Go do your work. I will say, um, having Melanie here yesterday, she literally went through seven to 10,000 photos. And this was one of her favorites. I know this is a podcast, so our listeners can't see this. I'll put this up somewhere. But that said, it's a lovely photo of all three presidents. And Dr. Henshaw, this must have been when you were newly installed. Yeah. But it's it's amazing to be able to see a photo with Pres- uh, Mr. Papp, Dr. Dunbar, and Dr. Henshaw. And I know at some point, uh, I, I need you to be here for at least six years, uh, the, the torch will be passed. But that said, this is something that you should take great pride in. Yeah, that, that was a unique moment there. It was at a Rotary Club meeting where I was, I was being inducted. I think we were pinning uh, uh, Mr. Papp and pinning Dr. Dunbar for uh, some accomplishment that they had had with Rotary. And it was just so, it was just so awe-inspiring for me to be able to stand in front of both of them and watch the three of us interact. Because they were sort of looking at me, thinking, you know, who's this, who's this, this numbskull coming in here? <laughs> <laughs> but I think I'll be in that same boat. I may be looking back and going, you know, wow, good luck to you. I don't know if you'll make it or not. 
And ladies and gentlemen listening out there, I will post some of these pictures at uh, redhawkpublications.com where the book is already on sale for pre-sale. It's regularly $40. It's on sale for $30 if you buy it on the pre-order. And you will get a free alumni bookmark and you will get free shipping while supplies last. You'll also get a nice dose of 1980s hairstyles, 1970s <laughs> leisure suits, and a whole bunch of nostalgia if you've been here as a student at Catawba Valley Community College. So go to redhawkpublications.com and pre-order that bad boy today, and we'll make sure that you get one as soon as they roll off the press. They're going to be hand-assembled right here on campus where we are printing them, making them, creating them, not sending them offshore, doing them right here at Catawba Valley Community College. Because that's what we do. (laughs) (laughs) That's right. Well, on behalf of, and we were trying to come up with a number yesterday of how many students we serve. We, we, and then it's got to be in the hundreds of thousands, you know, given how many we uh, have on campus at any given time. On behalf of those, thank you very much for your leadership that you've uh, provided here, the vision that you've put for this campus. Thank you for being here today, and thank you for uh, your third of that book. Uh, it, it, it makes for a much, uh, a very interesting read. Well, it was a lot of fun, and, and you know, when I first came here, I knew that this was a special place because of the people that were here. I'd heard about different individuals, the Tim Peelers, and people that were on this campus and I have just been inspired by all the great things that you all have done and I'm just glad I could be a part in making some of those things easy, easier than normal and, and uh, was willing to try some different things. Yes, thank you very much for nurturing those of us who like to push the envelope. <laughs> in odd and, ways. And push your patience. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the most patient person in the world sometimes, right? You are a very kind guy, I tell you. (laughs) Save my grits a couple of times. Well, thank you, and thank you for being here today. Um, I have one more challenge for you. All right. Can you say it? Red Pub Pod? Red Pub Pod. Red Pub Pod. Wow. Red Pub Pod. Yeah. Yeah, you can stop. (laughs) (laughs) But we will be using that. Thank you for being here, uh, for joining us on this podcast. By the way, if you listen to it late and the pre-sales are over, it goes back to its regular price of... $40. Yeah, so sorry. And you might not get a bookmark. Uh, yeah, because one of the things that Melanie's doing with the bookmark is she's putting a QR code on the bookmark that will take you to special things for alumni. And we also plan to build a database of the rest of our pictures and the rest of our images, full yearbooks that you can look through, and even a possibility of purchasing your uh, pictures and things like that from old yearbooks. So that QR code with the purchase of the book will get you so much more than just the book. So, And if you don't find yourself in the book, you probably find yourself somewhere in that seven to 10,000 range of pictures. Oh my gosh, there's so many pictures. Yeah. It's like finding Waldo. It's ridiculous. Yeah. yeah. Well, thanks for joining us here on Red Pub Pod. Red Pub Pod. Red Pub Pod. Thanks for listening to Red Pub Pod. Red Pub Pod. A podcast. Red Pub Pod. From Red Hawk Publications. Red Pub Pod. Red Pub Pod. Wow. Red Pub Pod. Yeah. Yeah, you can stop. <laughs> <laughs> but we will be inside.